Well, good evening and welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. It's nice to. Uh, this is the first time we've had something in Roche Hall since COVID. So, this is our return to somewhat normal. So, glad to see a good group of people here. We have a very interesting uh, subject tonight on the Quran, sort of its interpretation and Islam and things. Um, our presenter tonight is John Delamay. He's an uh, Episcopalian priest. He was ordained in 1990 at Breck School over here in Minneapolis, but he's a native Detroiter, but we won't pull that against us. I'm also a transplant to Minnesota. A little bit longer. Not much. So. Anyway, he uh, was there, did the masses at the school, taught religion, taught world religions. I don't know if anybody had a chance to look maybe his name up and look at his TED presentation on the uh, five major religions of the world. World, uh, Very good, very introductory, but very well done. And then I was, I was amazed. I looked down, 10 million views. I have a big family. <laughs> That, that's that's pretty incredible because we get pretty excited here at St. Pascal's when we get 200 views on one of our things. So that that's saying a lot. Um, he's been involved with the Islamic Resource Center and for many years here in Minnesota. He's uh, been ecumenical, I guess we would call that, in the Catholic faith, but in working with the Muslims and the Islam in the Twin Cities. My relationship with John goes back about seven years ago, I think. One Lent, at the beginning of Lent, I got an email from St. Thomas about an opportunity called By the Rivers. And it was an ecumenical Bible study. And the purpose was we would look at certain subjects, matters, and then we would look at the Old Testament that pertained to that one time. And then we come back the next week and we look at the New Testament reading and we discuss it. And then we look at the Quran reading about that. And we had many uh, different denominations of Christians in the group that came. John was one of them. Uh, we also had many different Jewish people from different temples that came and were very participatory in it, the group. And we occasionally have a Muslim person come and join us. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have that very often. And John, by de facto, was sort of our representative for the Quran to help try to explain some things for us. So when I was thinking about this presentation, I contacted Rabbi Allen, who had run that group for we met for about three years. And I asked him, I already thought about John in my mind, but I said, I'll contact Rabbi Allen and just ask him. And he also mentioned John, and we both thought, yeah, that would be a, for what we want to hear, would be a very good person to have come in and talk to us. So I'm really excited to let John talk and get out of here and uh, listen to what he has to say. So I'm looking forward to it as much. I would like to learn about the Quran. I've read some of it, we studied some of it, but it's still. A lot of questions for me. So welcome, John. So I'd love to begin with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Well, God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us, not only in famous ways like scripture, but also in the sunshine and the smile of a newborn infant and in the love of our families. We ask that you bless us as we learn tonight. Deliver me from the temptation from just being funny to also um, to be sincere. And thank you for this opportunity and for the beautiful people at St. Pat's School. Amen. So yeah, I do like to be funny. I'm a high school teacher. I can't help myself. Okay. Um, uh, but I don't want to be irreverent, and nor do I want to act like an expert, because the first thing I said to Rich, um, after, after he was nice enough to invite me, is, you know, I'm not a Muslim, right? And 
for me, the Quran is a very important book, but for me, it's not scripture. The Bible is scripture. And um, he said, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and maybe by the end, uh, we'll all figure out why that was okay. But raise your hand if you know somebody who's Muslim, either at work or in your neighborhood or whatever. Yeah, One of those people perhaps could do the next such talk. So um, I'm going to start with a quiz, uh, because <laughs> that's my training. Um, so I got about uh, 10 or 15 questions, and I bet you'll know some of them, and maybe a few of you will know them all, in which case I'm going to make you stand, and I'm going to bow in your general direction. What's the traditional color for the Muslim religion? White's an excellent guess. It happens to be green. Okay. Uh, where did Muhammad grow up? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is exactly right. Technically, it was just Arabia then. The Saudis had not come along, but it doesn't say that on the map anymore. And in the town of Mecca, which of course is a very important town. Is it the capital, by the way, of Saudi Arabia? Riyadh. Oh, Riyadh. Very good. Um, so why was Muhammad's childhood considered tragic? Now this one most people don't know. His parents died. What was that? His parents died. His parents died. And his guardian who took over died. And then his grandpa who took over after that died. Now imagine if you're a novelist and you begin the novel with an orphan that many times over. What's going to happen to somebody like that? Well, we'll see. <clears throat> uh, what did he do for a living from age 12 to age 40? Trader. He was a trader. He was a merchant. Um, he um, at first went on caravans with his uncle before his uncle died, and then he took over the caravan business. Um, and the, and the, the caravans, obviously, because desert sand is hard to move on, were camels rather than horses and, and wagons. Um, how did he meet his wife? This is such a romantic story. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Yeah, I think I, I must have hit the thing twice. Yeah. Somebody should have kept a straight face and said, wasn't she his boss? <laughs> um, yeah, she hired him to lead her caravan. She was, in fact, the boss. And there was something else that was unusual about their marriage. She was older. She was 40, he was 25, and she proposed to him. But she did it through her bestie. She asked her best friend to go see if he would laugh or what. <laughs> because. <laughs> and he said, no, I, I deeply respect you. And uh, so they got married and, <laughs> and fell in love. And he took over the, um, he took over the business um, as time went by. Now, um, a few years after the Quran began coming to him, he um, and his followers had to move from Mecca to Medina, and it's called the Hijra or Hijra. And does anybody know why? I know. Oh, it was <laughs> What's that? It was threatened. Exactly. Death threats. That makes you move. Um, there were death threats. His movement was um, really bad for business in Mecca. The main business of Mecca was tourism, but it was religious tourism, sort of like Jerusalem or Rome. People went there for pilgrimages. But their business model was that they had a different God for just about every single day of the year, and people would come for the pilgrimage for their particular God. So, you know, I don't know if they had t-shirt shops or, that, you know, little religious good shops, but certainly they sold idols and uh, holy water of various kinds. Yeah, question. How many followers were there? At the time they moved, it was about 200. Not many, but enough. And some of them were pretty uh, big muckety mucks in the town. And the folks in charge of the town felt this is really bad because Muhammad, as you probably know, 
believe that there's just one God and that idol worship is very bad. And so he wanted to put basically the town into a different line of work and they did not like that. Imagine going to Disney World and saying, anything that has to do with animated characters, we're not gonna do that anymore in this town. <laughs> I don't think people would go. Uh, okay, what are the rules for fasting in Ramadan? All day. All day. So that's 24 hours. Sunrise to sunset. That's right. Sunrise to sunset. And the fasting not only includes uh, food and drink and sex, but even water. Rich and I were wondering how on earth can you not drink water from sunrise to sunset? And the answer is it's apparently possible. And um, probably not recommended by your physician. All right, this is a little more complicated and tough. How come the Sunni and the Shia split? You've heard of Shiites, and that's a, the Western pronunciation of Shia. And the Sunni are kind of the majority. It's this, I don't know which is kind of like Catholic and which is like Protestant. You could, you could argue it either way. They split for a different reason than we did. But um, what was the reason? One of them wanted to follow the lineage of Mohammed down the straight down the road, and the other ones wanted a, a commission or a church committee uh, to decide what they should do. Or yeah. So that was that was something. Yeah, it was it was the difference. Thank you between something more democratic, and it actually wasn't democratic. It was going to be the consensus of the church committee. They probably called it a mosque committee, but still, yeah. all right. <laughs> it was the consensus of that committee, uh, which was all men. Um, and they were all people who were very close to Muhammad and were very upset at his death. And they had good reason to think that Muhammad would have agreed with them if he was still alive. The Shiites, on the other hand, had good reason too. Because Muhammad often said certain things about his obvious heir apparent, his son-in-law Ali. And a lot of people felt Ali, A-L-I, was definitely going to get the nod. And he didn't get it until the fourth time round. So he had to wait 20 years to become the leader. And it was after his death, which was a bloody one, that the two really started to fight. Okay, from what great city was Muhammad miraculously transported to heaven on a flying horse? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is right. And um, the Temple Mount. Anybody ever been to Jerusalem on pilgrimages? That beautiful dome of the rock, yeah. yeah. That golden dome is where tradition has it that Muhammad ascended into heaven. He wasn't dead yet. He was having a dream, but it was such a vivid dream that he believed it really happened. And the next day. People were laughing at him and saying, you know, the crazy stuff you come up with. And he said, okay, in about two days or so, a, a caravan's coming into town, and it includes the following things. I saw it on my way. And I said, yeah, right. It actually was true. Now, I, I don't know where miracles come from. I uh, believe in all the miracles that Jesus did. So Muhammad doesn't happen to be my prophet. But I think most Muslims would tell you, oh, definitely, that's what happened. Uh, how many times do you make the Hajj, the pilgrimage? Once. Yeah. You could make it a lot. If you live in Saudi Arabia, you could go a couple times a year. And it would make you a better person. Because when you make the pilgrimage, you have to be in a good mood the whole time. <laughs> you can't say any discouraging words to anyone. Yeah, it's really hard. Especially when it's hot, which it always is. Um, it's really difficult um, to make that pilgrimage and to stay in a good mood. And the other thing about the pilgrimage, if you're doing the full Hajj, not just a visit, um, you have to stand out on a plane and visualize yourself at Judgment Day meeting who meets you. We say St. Peter, ha ha ha. But who meets a Muslim on Judgment Day at the gates of heaven? Now, God's too busy and too remote. God doesn't come down to the gate. Jesus. 
Jesus. I'm not making that up. When I found that out, I couldn't believe it. Jesus never sinned according to Islam. Um, he was born of a virgin according to Islam. He was not crucified. God would have never allowed his son to be humiliated like that according to Islam. Now, I don't see it as humiliation. I see it as a, a connection with us and all the suffering that we do. And my Muslim friends say, well, that's an interesting rationalization, but <laughs> I, but no, we don't see it that way. So Jesus is the most qualified of all beings, except for God, to judge the living and the dead. And so Jesus is the person who does that. And on Judgment Day, it's Jesus who's got the big book. Uh, he needs the big book because he's not God. He's not, according to Islam, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know all the things that you've ever done. Uh, but he's got some bookkeepers that uh, <laughs> fill that book up with very good uh, information about your life. So you make one pilgrimage. Uh, what do you wear? What you're going to be buried in. You wear a white shroud. And not just any old white shroud. After you make the pilgrimage, you fold it up like my wife did her wedding dress. And you put it in a box. And um, it, it doesn't have quite the same feeling as a wedding dress in a box. But we never had any daughters, so she's not going to get to use it. Um, but if we had been Muslim and we had folded up our burial shroud, we would all use it. And when you go to the funeral of a Muslim person, their family has washed their body in person. You don't have the funeral director do it. You do it. You take care of that person. Their body is sacred. It's made in the image and likeness of God. So you do it. And then you wrap them up in that very same burial shroud. If they never got to go to Mecca, you wrap them up in a burial shroud. And this is one of the many reasons why most Muslims, if you ask, so do you want to take that pilgrimage? They'll say, oh, yes. I definitely do. So, So the next part, and I haven't got the sound linked into this, but I'll just put the mic over here. Um, the next part is the part that I was advertised to come and talk about, and that's the Quran. And um, this is a YouTube of the call to prayer. How many times a day? Five. 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 And uh, how do you know it's time to pray? Speaker. Somebody's singing it into a speaker. Have you ever heard it like you went to a Muslim country? It's kind of cool. I like church bells just fine, but if somebody, and it, it's always supposed to be improvised. If you're the singer, you can't go to the microphone and say to yourself, I'm gonna sing this the way I always do it. You have to be open to a new idea coming to you. Sing it in a different key, sing it more minor, sing it more major. It's a little bit like being a jazz singer. So, how many of you would like to improvise into a microphone for your whole neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, this is not a job that people compete like crazy to get. Somebody who's very holy, who's respected, who is male, and who has a good singing voice is the one. And they often do it for the rest of their lives, from the time uh, they take on the, the job. And they obviously have to live close to wherever the microphone is. In some towns, every mosque has a microphone, and uh, my wife and I, the first time we got to a Muslim country was Morocco. And I have slides for that, but we'll never get into that. Um, first time was Morocco, and we were in a town called Shefshawan, which is it's a classic National Geographic town. Everything is whitewashed blue. And it used to be that a lot of things were whitewashed blue, but the Chamber of Commerce figured out that this was really good for tourism. It's just beautiful. Even the sidewalks, they like wash blue. And we were camping. We have a Volkswagen camper van. And um, we were camping up on the side of the hill. And we heard the call to prayer and said, oh, that's so cool, just like they said. And then came the call to prayer a few seconds later from somebody over there. And then another one. I'm sure there were eight or nine. And 
it still sounded cool. And you know how when you're in the mountains, things kind of echo? Yeah, it was an amazing introduction to being in a Muslim country. So this is much different from that, but this is the actual recording of a guy um, singing the call to prayer, improvising, and here we go. God is the greatest. God is the most great. There is no other God besides God. Testify that Muhammad is the prophet, the seal, like sealing wax seal, the seal of the prophets, the last prophet. But yeah, it could take four or five minutes. And I am sure there are azans, the call to pray guys, 
who speed it up. Um, my sister says there's an old Jesuit at her Catholic parish in Detroit who can say morning mass in about 19 minutes. His <laughs> 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 name is Father Foley. Um, so this, uh, this is what they say. And they, they spread it all out. And maybe the reason it takes so long is to give people time to actually get to the mosque. Now the mosque, get, get, get out of bed for sure. The mosque is a room kind of like this. They're very horizontal, as opposed to especially European type churches, some, some synagogues which have a real big vertical dimension. The point of the mosque is you're shoulder to shoulder with your fellow man. And it's mostly men who pray in the mosque. Um, I, a woman told me and my wife, which didn't go down real well with my wife, women have much more important things to do at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> she didn't mind, she but no, not much more important. Just things to do at home that they're not excused from. And so it's mostly men, and the women um, tend to be um, in a separate area over on the side, sometimes in back. Um, and so this is uh, what they're saying. These are the Arabic words. Arabic is almost always, it is always written in some kind of cursive, and it goes from right to left. Okay, so a little bit of background, and then we're going to um, read some Quran together, and I'm going to invite volunteers to read things. It'll all be in English, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, so Muhammad uh, grew up in Mecca, and uh, Mecca, you'll notice, is way the heck down on the bottom. I didn't mean to cut it off, but that's kind of the point. The, the um, Persian Empire at the time was called the Sassanid Empire, and the Roman Empire was no longer in the West because all the barbarians had taken over. And so um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, was not terribly important at this point. Constantinople was the big uh, center of uh, Christian empire. And there it is in the middle of all the green. And, and that was the Eastern Roman Empire. And the famous Muslim poet Rumi was called Rumi because he was from Rum, which we would now call Turkey. But he was known as the Roman guy. Be like calling me Mini, because I'm from Minneapolis or something. Okay, so here's the problem. The Persians, in 1800 BC, received a revelation, the Ahura Mazda, and it was a really cool scripture about the forces of light versus darkness. God had spoken to them. Heaven and hell, even Judgment Day. The Jews, of course, had what we know as the Old Testament, they didn't simply call it the Bible. To them, it is old, but not in the sense of obsolete, just the Bible. And Moses, um, who did not have blue eyes, I don't think, <laughs> had received this revelation in the first five books, the Pentateuch. Um, and then Jesus, uh, of course, had a tremendous revelation, and his very way of living, Muslims say, was a revelation. But his message, the Injil of Jesus, um, Injil means good news, it means gospel. And um, the Muslims teach that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, excellent books, inspired by God, but they didn't get Jesus' message exactly right. And if Jesus could have, he would have gone around and corrected them. And that's why they needed to have somebody like Muhammad come along and receive the message straight from God, immediately tell everybody, this is what God said, memorize it right now. And I think you've you're aware that people in the olden days were much better at memorizing <laughs> poetry and lyrics. Uh, when I would ask my beginning French students years ago when I was a French teacher to memorize just like a little poem, it was like I had asked them to, I don't know, run a marathon or some impossible thing. They couldn't possibly do it. But memorization was a big feature, especially in societies that were not yet literate. Um, and Muhammad was one of those. He didn't read or write. Jesus, I think Jesus did. I think when he was doodling on the ground in front of that woman who was accused of adultery, 
And he certainly, when he was in the synagogue as a young man and reading from the scroll, I mean, he could have memorized it. The scroll was just a prop, but I think he was reading straight out of the scroll of Isaiah. But anyway, when they wondered, was God going to come to the Arabs? What's wrong with us that God does God comes to the Persians, God comes to the Christians, God comes to the Jews, God does not come to us. And there were a lot of Arabs who were kind of freelance monotheists. They weren't all like idolaters. And they a lot of them believed in an afterlife, although the, your typical Arab person on the street believed you have one life, it's the one you're leading right now. Whatever happens to you, that's what happens. And the only afterlife you have is if people remember you as a hero or a villain or whatever. It, it's simply you live on in people's memory. So the answer came to Muhammad, who, as we pointed out, uh, had a very difficult upbringing. Or, I'm sorry, a difficult childhood. His upbringing was actually quite lovely. All these people who cared for him were apparently very loving. He was uh, known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. Um, the, the kind of guy who never told the lie. The kind of guy who always kept his promises. Just a good guy. A little depressive. A little melancholy. Um, a little given to going off on his own and just kind of thinking. Um, and injustice really bothered him. The way people would take a wife for like a night. Marry somebody for one night and then cast her off. The way some rich people would enslave all sorts of people. Um, the way children could be beaten. The way little girls, in particular girl babies, could be just left out in the desert. It made him so angry. And he felt it wasn't just his opinion. He felt somehow the universe agreed with him. He felt that there was that all these gods at Mecca were just fake, and that the one there was one true God, and he, Muhammad, really wanted to get to know this God. But he didn't know much. He had met some Jews. He had a, a cousin who was Jewish. I think he'd heard of Christians, or maybe he'd met some. So he was aware of the idea of, of monotheism. Um, he, um, he had a, a kind of a midlife crisis when, uh, in, at the age of 40, he spent uh, quite a bit of time in a cave in a mountain. Uh, and it isn't a very big cave. I saw a picture of it before I came here. And it's you know, only a little bit bigger than maybe two of these tables together. But he would just go up there. It was very quiet. It was kind of echoey. And he, he could look up and see the stars. And he meditated. He prayed. He asked, please, God, could you help me? I want to be a happy man, but I really want to be a good man. And uh, all of a sudden, he felt that he was being squished. I'm sure there's a more a better term, but he was being squeezed. He was being pressed down by some heavy force. And the, the force had a voice, um, uh, identified himself as the angel Jibril, who we know as Gabriel, same guy that went to Mary, and Elizabeth, and, sorry, Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, and um, same guy. He didn't find that out until later. And the, um, the angel said to him, recite. Now it's also a word that means read, but if you don't know how to read, then recite is the better translation. But basically it's Tell a story, tell something, give testimony. And Muhammad basically said, oh, what should I recite? I haven't got anything, I'm not a poet or anything, I'm not an author. And he basically said a little more sternly, recite. And so now he's getting really scared. Um, finally, after the third time, a little bit like Peter um, in uh, this coming Sunday's gospel. Um, a little bit like that, that he had to tell him three times to recite. And finally he said, okay, what you're going to recite is there is one God who taught humanity by means of the pen. And he interpreted that as being, I'm going to tell you things and you're going to write them down or memorize them. And 
in his case, he memorized them, and he went to a scribe afterwards. And this is the God who created human beings from a clot of blood. In other words, from a tiny cell, uh, even smaller than a zygote. They didn't have zygote. I mean, they didn't. They didn't know what a zygote was. <laughs> We're so cool now. Um, so he began to receive these revelations. After the first one, he ran home to his wife, and he jumped into bed. She stood there looking at him. He said, cover me up. And she put the blanket on him, and he said, no, cover me up. And so she got in bed with him and hugged him. He was shaking, he was shivering, he was so scared because he thought he'd been visited by an angel, but maybe it was a devil, maybe it was a, an evil spirit. The, you, you all know what a genie is. The word genie is an English word that comes from the Arabic word jinn, which means a spirit, and they're usually kind of naughty. Okay. Sometimes very naughty, sometimes just a little bit naughty. Um, he began receiving these. He almost always received these messages from this very same angel in beautiful Arabic poetry um, uh, during the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they had a lunar calendar in those days too. And so the fact that it happened in the month of Ramadan told his followers, well, Ramadan's going to be a big deal for us. And it's, it was obviously so sacred to God that we're going to withhold food and drink during that month. From now on, that's going to be part of what we do. Okay, he went on to become so much more than Jesus ever had a chance to be. If Jesus could have lived to age 60, man, think of what he could have done. But they killed him. He'd only been in public ministry for three years. The Buddha got to be 80. Krishna lived a long, long life. And, and I mean, all these great religious figures who are sort of the savior figures in their religions. Well, Muhammad's not a savior, he's a prophet, I'm sorry. But he got to be 60, and his community grew. He was invited shortly thereafter to become the mayor of Yathrib, which um, was known as the city, Medina. <coughs> Kind of like New York is sometimes people say, I'll go to the city. Well, that's Medina, which was known as Yathrib. He was also a general. They were constantly under attack, and he marshaled all the forces. I don't know if he was good with a sword or not so good with a sword, but he was very good at organizing and commanding. And every once in a while, he got a brainstorm of military tactics. And on a couple of other occasions, he made really bad decisions, and a lot of people. Um, were killed or captured. So Jesus never had such a job, but Jesus' job, according to Islam, was strictly to be a prophet, not to lead a gigantic new movement, although it was good, Muslims would say, that he did. And now Islam is here to be even better, to be sort of God 3.0 or 4.0 or whatever you know, iteration of God is. Now, you can't see this terribly well, but this is the mountain, the very one that had the caves. And uh, you see all the white stuff? Those are people. That, those aren't birds or, you know, things that birds leave, would leave behind. Those, those are, sometimes there are two or three million that make pilgrimage. They're not all a lot on the mountain, but they're trying to go up to the top to look back to see Mecca. It's a really nice view. The cave is only halfway up, and I think it's on the other side. And only like a few people can go in uh, at any one time. So the Quran usually is, um, if you get a nice one, it's usually leather bound. It's almost always green, because of their color. And that calligraphy, I won't pick out all the letters for you, but it, um, it talks about Muhammad being the seal of the prophets, and he's the guy through whom the Quran uh, came. This is my favorite font. <laughs> it's just so, and this was popular in like the 800s. You, you, you can't get it on your Microsoft Word. And you're laughing, but if you look up Arabic and Microsoft Word, there are a lot of different Arabic fonts, and some of them are very cool looking. This one's called Kufic. 
And the big long lines are strictly artistic. There's no reason. Like if you wanted to write your name with a flourish, Rich could write R I C H if you wanted to. Um, so any letter that has uh, a little horizontal, you can really exaggerate to make it look beautiful. Now, Muslims, uh, this is a really interesting thing, and I've made this mistake a lot. Muslims um, are allowed to read the Quran in their own native language. Most Muslims nowadays are not Arabs. What's the biggest Muslim country in terms Indonesia. of population? Indonesia. Number two? Pakistan. Pakistan. Number three is India. That really surprises me. I think of India as a Hindu country. Mr. Modi thinks of it as a Hindu country too. Um, they don't call it a translation. They call it an interpretation. And um, my friend Safi Kaskas and his wife Iman here are meeting the Holy Father in Rome. And Safi is presenting him with a copy of his translation. And the cool thing about Safi's translation is it has hundreds of footnotes referring to the Bible. Because he lives in Bethesda, I think, Maryland, and um, is a computer engineer. And his special gift is making friends with Christians and showing them the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. That the Quran actually connects to the Bible in ways that we did not know about. So, the Quran says, among other things, that uh, Jesus had only one parent, Mary. Uh, the, the business about Joseph being um, kind of an adopted father, whatever, they don't have particularly a theory about Joseph. But um, according to the Quran, everybody knew Jesus just had Mary, and only Mary, and that she was a virgin. How did they know? We'll get to that. Um, Jesus defended her virginity speaking from the cradle. I'm going to uh, bring up that story shortly because it's just one of the most amazing miracles of Jesus that most certainly is not in the Bible. Um, Jesus was not crucified, as I mentioned. God rescued him so that he never died. Jesus was not God, but he never sinned, unlike even Muhammad. Um, Jesus' New Testament miracles are true. So, on one hand, they're really into Jesus, they're very big on Jesus. On another hand, they minimize him just a tiny little bit. And uh, we'll get to some of the reasons about that. By the time Muhammad was around, the Nicene Creed was long since written. The, um, the period of accusing these other sects of Christianity of being heretics was kind of over, and all the different theories about who Jesus was that, that are not what we would consider orthodox were pretty much pushed to the periphery. Um, Muhammad in the Quran reports that the angel Gabriel said, that's why we need this Quran, because there's so many Christian ideas that just contradict each other. And they didn't get it right. So you are going to get this right. You're going to go to your wife after you're done shivering or whatever you do, and, and you're going to tell her, and people are going to write this down, and they're going to get it accurate. Because the Christians blew that. They didn't get it down accurately right from Jesus. Now that timer was to tell me that we're going to take a break. That's of uh, the Quran, and it consists of 114 chapters. Um, it was all written pretty much steadily after it was received over less than 20 years. And um, then it was rearranged into a slightly different order. And the order is somewhat mysterious. And um, the, the, the first chapter is kind of the intro, but then after that, it's pretty much in order of how long they are. And why that should be, I don't know. It is orderly in a way, 
And uh, little kids often start, you know, they have to memorize a chapter, so they'll say, oh, I'll, I'll memorize one, <laughs> number 114. It's like four or five verses. Um, and when you get all the way up to number two, al bakara, which means the cow, the heifer, um, that is like a quarter of the whole book. Um, so there are nevertheless, there are nevertheless uh, people as young as 11 who have memorized the entire book. Now, you can find, you can find YouTube something, yeah? And um, they've got the whole thing memorized. And um, I'm not going to play this because I want to get right to the, yeah, question. <coughs> <laughs> it's about a third as long as the Bible, maybe a little less. Usually there's so many footnotes that it, it's pretty thick, but if you get one without a lot of footnotes, you know, this, yeah. I had seen plenty of Qurans that are, you know, about that size. The one from the library, I bet it had it, it, it was uh, It was 400 pages, and I figured it was about the length of the New Testament. Yeah, that, that's about it. Was about the length of the New Testament. Yeah, because the Old Testament is much longer, two to three times. Yes, uh, just in terms of words. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to um, play very much of this, but I just want you to hear a slightly different method of chanting. the um, The Quran, when somebody says they are going to read the Quran or recite the Quran. <coughs> If you're doing it in public, you have to sing it. You don't just say it in your regular voice because it's sacred. Um, they don't, to them, Jesus is not the Word of God. The book is the Word of God. Uh, Jesus is, to us, Jesus is the most perfect revelation of what God is like. To them, it's more the Quran, it's more based on the book and the words of the book and the sound of it in this classical Arabic. So I'm just going to play a couple verses and then we're going to read some. So if you're, um, if you're in... Did I turn it off? Did I turn it off? There's a whole switch there. I did. Um, here we go. It's more meditative. It's like humming, and you feel it in your whole body. Um, if you ever sang in a choir, um, your choir teacher probably told you, you know, hold that. Just let's just hum this. Let's not try and sing the words. Let's just hum it. So um, I wonder if we could have a volunteer to read. This is not the story of Noah. Because they've got the story of Noah in the Bible. They've, they've read the Old Testament. They know the story of Noah. This is just a reference to or a commentary on it. Could somebody just read this slide? Yeah, go ahead, please. So the, <clears throat> Noah called us, and how excellent was our response. We saved him and his family from the great distress. We made his descendants the survivors and left for him favorable mention, among later generations. Peace upon Noah among all people. This is how we reward those who do good, for he was among our believing worshipers. We drowned the rest. Okay. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know, we <laughs> drowned the rest. Who is we? God. God. 
God is speaking in the royal we. Isn't that interesting? There's only one God, but you know, when Queen Elizabeth doesn't like a joke, she says, we are not amused. <laughs> and uh, when, God, when God doesn't like something, he is definitely not amused. Uh, somebody else read, this is uh, a little bit of Abraham. Thank you. Abraham said, I will go away to my Lord. He will guide me. <clears throat> my Lord grant me a righteous son. So we gave him the good news of a gentle boy. And when the boy was old enough to work with him, he said, My son, I have seen in a dream that I must sacrifice you. So see what you think. He said, My father, do as you are ordered. You will find me, God willing, patient. But soon as they had Thank both you. <laughs> but soon as they both had both submitted to what they thought to be God's will, and Abraham had laid his son down on the side of his face, we called to him, Abraham, you have fulfilled the vision. This is how we reward those who do good. This was clearly a grave trial, and we ransomed him with this is the end, I promise. With a great sacrifice, <laughs> and we left the later generations saying of him, Peace be upon Abraham. This is how we reward those who do good. For Abraham was among our believing worshippers. Then we gave him the good news of Isaac, a prophet from among the righteous, and we blessed him and Isaac. Okay, so Isaac came along, it appears, after this sacrifice. Now, that's not the story that we know. The story that we know, Abraham keeps it a secret from his son. I think because he's so horrified at what he's being asked to do. And his son, I mean, the, the Old Testament version of this is just so painful to read. And he says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham makes something up. God will, well, that's not making it up. He says, God will provide. God will provide the sacrifice, my son. Now the rabbis often, as Rich and I learned in that class, Julie, the rabbis said there shouldn't be a comma there. It should say, God will provide the sacrifice, colon, my son. At which point, Isaac didn't run away. Now, we don't read it that way. We read it that he simply had faith. Who's the son, the gentle boy, who hears that daddy had a dream in which he's going to be sacrificed? Isaac hasn't been born yet. It's got to be Ishmael. Now, the Quran does not say it is Ishmael. So Muslims can believe it was Ishmael. They also can believe it was Isaac. But most Muslim teachers will tell you that it was Ishmael. And who's Ishmael's mom? Hagar. Hagar. And Hagar was the servant of Sarah. How come Abraham is getting his wife's servant pregnant? They needed a surrogate. Right? And Sarah couldn't get pregnant. Now, the Quran doesn't say that because they've already read the Old Testament. They know the story. And they're just seeing a couple of little modifications that are made. In my opinion, the Quran always finds that all the heroes of the Bible were much nicer than the Bible portrays them. <laughs> and I have to step out of my, you know, world religions role for a second and say, I kind of like how messed up all the people in the Bible are. <laughs> I, I can relate to them. Um, Abraham pawning his wife off as um, his sister so that he can, you know, not himself be killed and so that he can make a big fat dowry from Pharaoh or King of Imelech. Um, I mean, don't, don't get me started. There are just so many. You can think of them too. David dancing out there in his little underpants. <laughs> and his wife is so mad at him. David standing on the roof looking down at Bathsheba, taking her bath. You know, it, it's all right there, and I think, 
makes me believe the Bible more. That's just me. Yeah. Does this then replace or correct the errors yes. that they thought were inherent? And so this is like a correction. Then. That's a really good way of putting it. They would see it as a correction. And most of the time, they agree with what's in the Bible. But I'm picking out the differences because it's so interesting. Um, and I, I'm trying not to pick on Islam by doing this. I'm not saying, see how inferior they are. I'm simply saying, this, 600 years later, this is a different take on many of the stories that we're extremely familiar with. We're going to move on because uh, I want to get to question time. Um, I need another reader. We've got Moses and Aaron now. And Moses certainly was not a perfect human being, but he was awfully good. But, you know, he killed somebody. Who would like to read? We certainly showed great kindness to Moses and Aaron. We saved them and their people from a terrible predicament. Pause for a second. What was their terrible predicament? They were slaves. And they were sort of hereditary slaves. They were not briefly slaves until they paid off the note. They were slaves. Keep them. And we supported them so that they prevailed. And we gave them the clarifying book. And we guided them on the straight path. And we left the later generation saying of them, Peace be upon Moses and Aaron. Okay. No mention of the golden calf. <laughs> and that would be a very Muslim thing to mention. Idolatry is like the biggest sin of all. But they don't mention it because they've got the book of Exodus. And they study it. They, they, they know those stories. But what they're saying is, all things, after all things are said and done, Moses and Aaron were really good people. They did the right thing. They submitted themselves to God's will. They did what God wanted. And um, God, in return, got them out of that terrible predicament. And we've got one more character, Elijah. We don't know as much about Elijah nowadays as we might, but uh, what do you guys remember? Chariot of fire, very good. He didn't die. What else? Cave business. The cave business. He ran away because he was um, a wanted man by Queen Jezebel, which is such a great name for a villain. <laughs> Queen Jezebel. Uh, my wife used to, my wife grew up um, Baptist, and uh, she grew up uh, thinking that anybody who wore makeup had to be evil because the thing that Jezebel was reputed to be was a painted woman. And uh, she didn't understand that, that meant some other things too. Um, and the reason Queen Jezebel was so mad and put his face on a wanted poster, the reason he had to go to that cave was that he had, in a scientific, controlled scientific experiment, had proven Jezebel and her uh, polytheistic religion to be false. Does anybody remember how you get such a big gold star? Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, he called on, uh, had them call on their wall to light the fire of the wood that was there, and didn't happen, and then they took the wood, covered it in a whole bunch of water, and more water, and more water, and then uh, it, uh, it lit up. Yeah. Uh, Big old lightning bolt from heaven zapped it, even though the wood was wet. And so you have the control group and the experimental group, just like in science class. And the variable was fake God, real God. And he was real cocky. He, he trash talked them. He said, oh, maybe your God is asleep. Maybe your God has gone off to the bathroom. Uh, you know, just kind of wandered away. Uh, call him louder, sing louder. And, you know, nothing happened. And so um, Elijah really made Jezebel and her religion looked like a fool, and her husband was supposed to be the king of Israel. I mean, he was the king of Israel, but he was supposed to be like a good Jew, um, but not. Um, okay, uh, let's finish this one up. 
Did you get to the end? Oh, Elijah was indeed one of the messengers. When he said to his people, will you not remain mindful of God? Do you call upon Baal and leave the best of creators, God, your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers? But they denied him, so they will be brought for punishment, except for God's devout worshipers. And here the Quran is admitting that at the time, even the Jews believed there were other gods around. It's just they were not supposed to worship those other gods. Muhammad said, they're all fake. Jesus, of course, said the same thing. Um, later prophets said the same thing. Okay. And then we have Jonah. I thought that was the last, but I think this one really is the last. One more reader. <laughs> What were you doing, Jonah? Would you please think? Jonah was one of the messengers. He ran away to a loaded ship, but they cast lots and he lost. So they threw him into the sea, and a great fish swallowed him, for he was blameworthy for what he had done. And he had not been one of those who glorified God's limitless glory. He would have remained inside its belly until the day they are resurrected. But we cast him ill on an open shore, and we made a gourd vine to grow over him, and we sent him to a hundred thousand people or more. They believed, so we let them enjoy their life. <laughs> okay, it just, it's so brief, it's so terse. They believe in the resurrection of the dead, obviously. Uh, they believe that Jonah was a bad boy until he was a better boy. Um, and they certainly know the Jonah story, but that story is so fun. The Quran is not about fun. It's not, it's not about storytelling. It's a correction. It's an overarching look at salvation history in which God wants people to believe in the Judgment Day, in the sequence of prophets culminating with Muhammad. Uh, there aren't going to be any more prophets after Muhammad used the Rasul, the seal, the final one, the last word. And um, that is what they're going for. Okay, I've got a couple of other things to say, and then I want to open it up for questions. And um, the first thing is, where does Islam get its theology? And the first source, obviously, is the Quran itself, the written scripture from the very earliest uh, times. So it's a pretty reliable, we think, version of what was actually said at the time. The second um, would be the other sacred books, the inspired books of the Old and New Testament. The third, sorry, the second major category is the sayings of Muhammad. These are known as the hadith. And there are ways of determining how certain people are that Muhammad really said it. If there are a bunch of independent witnesses, and they all say it, maybe in slightly different words, in different books, maybe in different countries, Muhammad probably said that. Um, it's like when Jesus tells the little girl, Talitha Kumi, you know he really said that. Because they hardly put any of the original language in the New Testament. It's all in Greek. But every once in a while, the Lord's Prayer. You know he actually said the Lord's Prayer word for word, those exact words. You just, you just can tell. Um, and so the sayings of Muhammad, um, there's, uh, there's a thing called an isnad, which is kind of a chain of footnotes. And I'm sure if you try to read the book, you'd fall asleep. But it's a, it's a chain of footnotes going all the way back that keep track of how sure they were and who the different witnesses were who said that Muhammad said this or that, okay? So uh, things about women being in the back of the mosque, that's not in the Quran, but Muhammad said so. Um, the eating of pork, I wish I could tell you whether that's in the Quran, the, sorry, the avoiding of eating pork whether that's in the Quran or Hadith, but it's a tradition that goes all the way back from the beginning. And so if it was in the Quran, there's no doubt. If it was a saying with a very good isnad, a very good chain, then you don't do that, or you do that, depending on whether it's a 
positive or negative commandment. And finally, the rulings and the precedents. The teaching authority of Islam is not, you know, in the Catholic Church, there's the magisterium, which is a centralized teaching authority. And uh, if something passes muster, that's pretty much Catholic doctrine. Um, it doesn't hold for Protestants and Orthodox, maybe. But um, in uh, Islam, there are many different sects. So if you are a member of a particular sect that has a tradition of believing this or that, for example, in uh, predestination, there are some sects that believe we are predestined because logically, if God knows everything, God knows exactly when I'm going to die and how. Well, if it's already known, then can I just drive any old way for the next hour and years? Because God, you know, it's already set. But um, Shia Muslims believe in a very literal, almost Calvinistic kind of um, predestination. Okay. So, three more slides, kind of a comparison and contrast. In case I haven't mentioned all of these things, this is the official like Islam 101 right here. So you can't maybe see that they're different colors, but on the left I have some um, things about Islam, and on the right things about Christian equivalent. So in Islam, the way you join is by reciting the creed, but it's really short, unlike our creeds that we say on Sunday, which uh, some of the Nicene Creed in particular is quite long. You pray five times a day. Anybody here pray? Father, <laughs> have you prayed five times today? Yes. Yeah. I think I've probably prayed three. Okay. How long do they pray each time? Oh, that's a great question. It can be as short as three minutes, and on Friday noon, it's about a half hour. Yeah. And when they pray, when they get called to prayer, are they doing their own prayer, or are they doing a recited prayer, or memorized prayer? A little bit prayer? of both. You, you have to do the recited memorized prayer, but it's pretty short. And the interesting thing, we had a, a young Muslim journalist stay with us. My wife is a journalist, and she came, to the, uh, the woman came from Egypt. And um, she asked me why I never prayed. And I said, well, you know, I do. Well, I never see you praying. And I said, oh yeah, you see me praying. And then I came to realize that in Islam, you don't pray with your mouth. You pray with your whole body. And if you don't bow, and you don't stand up, and you don't look to heaven, and you don't touch your forehead to the ground as an act of humility, you're not really praying. You're saying stuff that's good, but that's not really praying. And I was really surprised um, to hear that. A tithe in Islam is 2.5% of your savings, not your income. So if you're very poor and you don't have anything saved, you don't have to give anything to the poor. You should, because it's good for you, but it's not required. But Muslims don't have banks that um, charge uh, that pay interest on savings. So, um, and if you can't take out a loan if you're a Muslim, although there is a modern thing called, um, um, uh, I can't remember the name, but it's a, a religiously approved kind of loan that has something that looks an awful lot like an interest payment to me. <laughs> but um, I, I have had friends assure me that it's not just a legal giving, that it really is not interest. Anyway, you, when you buy a house, you pay cash. you got to save up all that money. And every year while you're saving, 2.5%. Now in most Muslim countries, you don't have to buy a house because you live in the house with dad and Uncle George and, you know, all sorts of people. You may have 50 or 60 people in the family house, and that house has been in your family for generations. So a mortgage, you know, the fact that they can't take out a mortgage doesn't bother them that much. They already own it. Um, uh, Father, I'm sure that everyone here puts 10% of their income <laughs> in the plan. <plate>, yeah. <laughs> Um, we've talked about fasting during Ramadan. Some Christians do fast, but not as much. Um, everybody should make a pilgrimage, whereas in uh, Christianity, some can. It's a cool thing. I've been a pilgrimage 
to uh, Jerusalem and, and just uh, London. Um, in Islam, they are monotheistic, but there are 99 names for God. And in my favorite mosque in the Twin Cities, where I have a couple friends in Plymouth, um, they have the 99 names on the real pretty cards all the way around the, the room, much as we might have statues of saints or other things. But these are names of God, the beneficent, the merciful, the, the owner of the day of judgment, the saver, the advisor, the conscience, just all these poetic kind of names. We, um, we are monotheistic too, but our uh, metaphors are much more carefully defined as being more than just a metaphor. There are three persons, three ways in which God is God. Um, talked about scripture, talked about prophets. Uh, Muslims and Christians believe pretty much the same thing about angels. They believe that angels are beings that are made of light. So they're not like corporeal. They don't have wings. They're just made of light, which is why people have a hard time recognizing them. Um, but if you think about it, the people in the Bible have a hard time recognizing angels too at first, and then they figure it out. Um, Jesus is the judge on the last day, the day of judgment. God is the owner of the day of judgment, but Jesus is the judge. And finally, the big day for Muslims is Friday. In most Muslim countries, kids don't go to school on Friday. and. Uh, in some Muslim countries, they go to school in the morning, and then they go home. And the men, at least, will go to the Friday noon prayers. And even here in uh, Minneapolis, at, um, if you wanted to visit a mosque for prayers, and I bet people would be so happy to have you come because they're afraid that you hate their religion and you think that they're all terrorists and bloodthirsty and God knows what other um, stereotypes, they'd be very glad to have you come. Um, it's Friday noon is the big is the big worship service. And there's usually, um, you usually go home and have a big meal. It's not in the parish hall or the mosque hall. Although mosques almost always have a room something like this, maybe downstairs. Um, no pork, no alcohol. Uh, Christianity doesn't really have very many uh, dietary laws, maybe during Lent, maybe some other holy days. Um, Judaism has quite a few more dietary regulations. Their idea of sin is really interesting. We say we've been cursed somehow by our origin. We have original sin. They would say, no, we just forget that we come from God. I think that's, I think that's definitely true. <laughs> um, whether it's the actual definition of original sin, I don't know. Um, the Greek word paraclete in the Gospels is interpreted by Muslims as being this is somebody who's going to come along and help, and that must be Muhammad. Um, we view the paraclete as another synonym for the Holy Spirit. Um, Muslims would say that the Gospels are great, but they were altered from Jesus' original message, and unfortunately the Gospel of Jesus is a hypothetical book. No official gospel of Jesus. Although the four books are the gospels about Jesus and the message of Jesus, and as much as it can be found in book form, it's a tangible witness to Jesus' person and his faith. Um, we don't believe that Quran and scriptures is a scripture for Christians. You're certainly allowed to read it. Um, and um, as I think you found it. It's not easy to read. Um, it's a little bit like reading Proverbs straight through or Psalms straight through or something like that. It's just, it's a lot of poetry. It jumps around and um, it isn't meant to be read that way. It's meant to be heard and recited and it's supposed to inspire you. Finally, the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, according to Islam, is the angel Gabriel. And the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, of course, is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. So that's a difference. I'm going to stop there and um, take questions for as long as people have them. And if you don't want to stay for the questions, it will not hurt my feelings if you've got to go home and put mulch down or whatever it is you might have. <laughs> so if, if uh, in a 
mosque here, if I were going there and they were saying the Quran, what language would they use? Arabic. That's the other thing. It's like the olden days of the Catholic Church when uh, the Mass was in Latin. Uh, although I don't know where the readings, the Gospels, and the Epistles, were those in Latin too? You guys are all too young to know. Too no, 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 they weren't in Latin. They weren't in Latin? No. Okay. They might have been in. I was in the French church, so they weren't in French. That makes sense. Um, and if you go to a synagogue, it's almost all in Hebrew. It's like when kids go to Sunday school, Muslim kids, they're learning Arabic. That's the main thing they're learning, is Arabic. Because if you don't know Arabic, you can't really read the Quran. And there's something about the poetry that's incredibly important. And that was the language that God chose to speak in, finally, after speaking to the Persians and the Christians and the Jews. More questions? I'd love to. Do you think have an equivalent of a confirmation or a bar mitzvah? Young adults? No. But, especially in the United States, Muslim congregations are figuring out ways to have graduations from you know, different stages of Sunday school. There is a big deal when, it's kind of like a first Holy Communion, except there's not a big ceremony at which everybody points at you. Um, but when you first fast during Ramadan, Everybody in your family is very proud of you, and they say, wow, that's hard, good for you. And sometimes as young as 10 or 11 year olds do that, but typically when you're a young teenager, you should fast. Mm -hmm. Confirmation. I think the pilgrimage, in a way, is like confirmation, and that's typically done as an adult. And some people wait until they're quite old to make the pilgrimage because they feel they're gonna be better able to Rehearse Judgment Day, having lived longer and um, <laughs> sinned more, and <laughs> understood better what it means to be a Muslim. And some people just go many times. Yeah. Is there a human leader in Islam, like a pope or a bishop or a and will women ever get to the top? <laughs> Well, um, I think they don't even get to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not that far along there. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to get into the ordination of women in the Catholic Church. But, you know, the Episcopal Church took until 1976 to ordain women, and they were they were breaking church law. The bishops were really, really bad about it, but they got over it. Um, yeah. Um, um, you know, until a hundred years ago, um, I think the treatment of women in Christian countries and Muslim countries wasn't that different. Yeah. But it hasn't really advanced much. In most Muslim countries, women can be educated and so on, but in terms of religious leadership, yeah. it's, a, it's a very, very, very male uh, purview. Um, in addition to that, there's nothing like a pope or a bishop. There are schools of jurisprudence, many of them, and I have a scary looking chart. I'll just put up in case you're bored. <laughs> I don't know where to go. Ooh. Oh, that's Chef Shama. I have travel slides in case you guys weren't interesting. <laughs> in case you guys were like just bored or something, I was, you know, if I needed to fill time, I could have shown you the travel slides. <laughs> They're amazing. Um, this is I, I don't expect you to <laughs> memorize it or anything, but there's the Sunni Shia split and then all these different schools and it all has to do with the nature of authority but they're all men they're all men and there's there is one mosque in Los Angeles that is famous for being a women-led mosque. But it's pretty much only women. And that's not, yeah, go ahead. And uh, as I was reading Quran, I came across many, many statements that really troubled me. 
you mentioned women, and there, there is one Sarah that's labeled women. Yep. And the Sarah 4, verse 34, I, I, I'll quote it from the, the Quran I had, that I read. It said, men have authority over women because God has made the one superior to the other, and because they spend their wealth to maintain them. Good women are obedient. They guard their unseen parts because God has guarded them. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, admonish them, forsake them in beds apart, and beat them. <laughs> then if they obey you, take no further actions against them. And right away I thought, does God condone beating yeah. of women? Yeah. Now remember the, the Quran is, is dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, and they believe that they have the last word of God. They've heard the last word from him. Uh, and as I went through, I found this a lot of statements in there that are just anti-Christian, and I don't know, uh, my, my opinion is that it may be a religion, but it is more cult-like, created by man, than a true religion that is not inspired by God. And that's, and you're, you're welcome to take it, you know, and read it, but you'll find these kinds of passages. But then again, after they do a lot of trashing of, of the Christian religion, they come back and say, it says, believers, those who follow the Jewish faith, Sabaeans and Christians, whoever believes in God and the last day and does what is right shall have nothing to fear or regret. And that's how. 180 degrees opposite from what he said earlier, and he made another statement like that. Those those that say, uh, let's see, yeah, those that say our Lord is God and follow the straight path have nothing to fear or to regret. They are the heirs of paradise, there to dwell forever as a reward for their labors. So that that's as Christians are okay, are okay, but there's dozens of statements that said we're not. Yeah. And finally, for all of us men out here, we can look forward to heaven. Okay. <laughs> and this is this is the tidings, the tidings seventy eight verse thirty five. As for the righteous, they shall surely triumph. There shall be gardens and vineyards and high bosomed maidens for companions. <laughs> overflowing cup. Now it doesn't say anything about the women. What are what are the women to look for? It was written by a man. <laughs> Similar to the Bible, we should all try to remember. Yeah, so we got a good deal going. If, uh, <laughs> I, I would encourage you like to, 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 Bob. to pick a pick a copy up and, and it, it's easy to read. Yeah, you know, read ten pages a day. I have to say it's about 400 pages long, and 40 days you'll be done with it. But you'll, you'll see things in there that, yeah, I, I can see this, I can believe this, and then you'll see other things that I just can't accept. It. I, just, I just don't see that God would say this. So that's, that's yeah. my point. Our Bible says, wives be submitted to your husband. Our New Testament says that, that too. And exactly. silence in the church and yeah. right. a lot of yeah. other things. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Any response to that, Father? Or? No response. To what he just said? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think um, I'm still a Christian, so that's the most important response of all. Um, I think that um, it, I think that our religion is very patriarchal also, and I don't think God wants it that way. And. I don't know how Islam's going to get out of being a patriarchal religion, or whether they have that ambition, uh, because there aren't too many anti-patriarchal statements that I'm aware of in the Quran. Um, so I'm a very happy being a Christian, and I don't think that the Quran is scripture, and yet, when you know Muslims, and you go on car rides with Muslim cab drivers, and you listen to what they're listening to, they're listening to the Quran. And you ask them, what is that? And get them to tell you. And they'll, they'll tell you what the poetry means. 
and uh, I'm sure they're not listening to the poem about beating your wife. <laughs> but, you know, if you wanted to nail me with, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff uh, in the Bible, um, you probably could. It's probably good. The Bible is not a history book. Um, the Bible is a library. Uh, yeah, question. I have a different question, but I'll just say this. I don't think Christ talks down about women. Paul, because of his legal background, seemed to be the one really pushing the button on women. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> um, I did have a question. What can you tell me of the differences between an imam and the ayatollah? Oh, great. An imam is simply the person that stands in front of the room and reads the prayer. And one can study for that role, or one can. Uh, but you're still not ordained. They don't have ordination exactly. Uh, but they have qualifications, so you can study to be a qualified human. Um, but if you're in a really small congregation, probably the most holy, faithful, good, observant, whatever guy will be regarded as the imam and will lead the prayers. But if somebody who's more qualified shows up in the mosque that day, that guy would step aside and let you know, the expert to it. An Ayatollah is a scholar who, um, in Shia, Islam, not Sunni, who is of the highest rank. It's a little bit like being a cardinal, except it's not a cardinal. Why did I say that? Um, <laughs> they, don't, they don't have, like, deacons, priests, bishops, so on. They, they don't have that kind of hierarchy. But within the schools of Islamic law and teaching, the Ayatollah is somebody who's appointed to that role by the community as being the most expert of all. And there aren't very many of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's one sect in Saudi Arabia that's called Wahhabi or Wahhabism. Are they the ultra conservatives of the? There are um, some that are even more conservative than that, but yes. Okay. Super conservative. They politically were very astute in the 1800s, and the House of Saud made an alliance with them that I have a feeling plenty of people regret to this day. But it would be as if Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and so on um, made an alliance with modern day fundamentalists. There were no fundamentalists per se back at that time. Yeah. Very, very conservative. Very anti-female. Yeah. If somebody wanted to read the uh, Quran, what would you recommend like that one that the general is giving to the Pope? Would that be one or I would very much recommend um, Safi, that's S A F I. His last name is Kaskas, K A S. K-A-S, and it's called the Quran, a modern interpretation. I'll find the slide, but I'd really recommend it. He's a sweetheart, too, and his wife is every bit, I mean, they're amazing. Really, really beautiful, loving people. There's Safi. Yeah. You want to see that blue city, don't you? <laughs> it's so beautiful. Here we go. So it looks like this. Um, the Quran with references to the Bible. And uh, you can buy it on Amazon. I have it on my, I have all my books on Kindle because then I can have them sit in my laptop. There's also an interpreter's Quran, if you really want to nerd out. And it's, um, it's got a bunch of different arguments by different scholars. Somebody over here that you're looking at. I have a question. Um, are all the Muslims in this area the same sect? No. So there are differences. Oh, so many differences. Oh. But there's such a minority in the United States. And right now, they are so politically incorrect, unpopular. There's so much. I would say misunderstanding of Muslims as people that um, they can't afford to argue about stuff. So you'll frequently find people who really ought to be Shia praying at a Sunni mosque. 
There is a difference in some mosques that are very small, especially on the West Bank, tend to be either Somali or Ethiopian or Eritrean or Sudanese. And that's a cultural thing. Like, I don't know St. Pascal Bailon, whether this was originally a Polish church or a German church or what, but back in my hometown of Detroit, all the churches, the old churches, especially the French ones, uh, were very ethnic. And uh, my wife was raised Swedish Baptist, not some other kind of Baptist, but Swedish Baptist. <laughs> what else? Yes? Um, if, if you're trying to make a, a point about the fact that um, it, that Jews, Christians, and Muslims are all agreeing on the same point of something when you're trying to write your legislators to say, you know, we are Jewish, we are a Judeo-Christian Muslim country, and we all believe in these things. If it's in the Old Testament, is it pretty safe to presume that that we can that I can say that? Yeah, although there are a lot of genocides in the Old Testament um, that God ordered that you know, I don't think we're in favor of. Right. And, um, and uh, I mean, that, but yes, if, if there's an ethical teaching, if you think uh, about the church's social teachings, yeah. when it comes to social teachings, there's going to be agreement on those kind of things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. On religious questions, not so much. Right. But legislators aren't going to weigh in on religious questions. They leave that to the Supreme Court. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Is there an original scroll of these writings, or are we like we not are? anymore? There's some very old ones, but I don't think there are any original ones. I think there's some from the 900s or the 1000s. So there's. Like a lot of our scrolls have transcription errors, and the way they get around that is by looking at multiple scrolls to see where the errors crept in. Yeah, I think if you if you look at a Jerusalem Bible or a New Revised Standard Bible, that is as close as we can come, given archaeology and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that, to what they originally said. And I think the Muslims have even a little bit more reason to believe that it is accurate, at least as it was written down uh, at the time. So the transcription errors are corrected in the same way that you know, a new version of the Bible corrects things when they discover manuscripts. Please. So only one was about the different degrees of strictness that the Oh, yes. Different degrees of strictness among Muslims. Now, I know this is not true of Catholics or Episcopalians. <laughs> there are some Muslims who drink, and they don't really hide it. <laughs> um, and their grandma is probably mad. Um, there are Muslims, I'm sure, who eat pork. Uh, it's hard to resist bacon. Um, on, a, on a more serious note, um, there are Muslims who take more than five, four wives. Now, the Quran specifically allows a person, a man, to have up to four wives. Um, but there are loopholes in that. Um, you could divorce one, marry another, and you're still at four. Um, but when I, I was a young, uh, I did a gap year after college, and I taught um, English in West Africa. And the chief of the, the um, town that I taught in was supposedly a Muslim, but he had ninety-something wives. <laughs> I'm not making that up. And you know, on holidays they would all line up and, and give everybody a little gift. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the original reason for plural marriage is if the men are getting killed in large numbers and you're in a patriarchal society, if you are a loose woman, and I don't mean sexually, if you're a loose woman, in other words, you don't have a husband or a father or some kind of protector, you could be very seriously harmed. So widows 
were advised to get married ASAP, and there weren't nearly enough men to go around in the early days because they were getting killed uh, in battle or in duels or in honor challenges or any of those kind of medieval things. Um, it, it actually, um, Oh, we, I, I decided not to play that whole thing. You, you didn't sleep through anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, um, uh, the, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, um, do you want to be the, the mother of a great prophet? And she says, yes. And um, he says, all right. Um, and she says, well, how can this be since I have not had relations with any man? And he says, with God, anything is possible. And the, um, the Holy Spirit, what we would call the Holy Spirit, or the paraclete, or the power of God, overshadowed her, and she became pregnant. And immediately the town was scandalized because they knew she was a virgin, but obviously she was lying. So she went to a place outside of town to the east when it was time to give birth. And she was in so much pain that she said, I wish I had died rather than um, be in this much pain. And the same angel came and said, actually don't wish for that because if you die, you know, I couldn't have given you this opportunity. Um, just look over here, there's a palm tree, lean against that palm tree and below you there will be a spring of water. And sure enough, she's holding onto the palm tree and there's a spring of water and the palm tree drops some dates and uh, I think, you know, now you get ice cubes and nothing more when you're giving birth, but um, she, eight days, she gave birth to Jesus and the very next day she went back to town holding the baby and they were getting ready to kill her for being, you know, a liar and a, a loose woman. And, oh, I forgot, the angel also said, and this shall be a sign to you, you will not speak for, I think it was three days or something like that, but you won't speak. So she got home with the baby and she wasn't really sure what to do, but she knew she couldn't say it. So they said, who's, who's the father of that baby? You dirty woman. And she just pointed to the baby and that's when Jesus spoke. And I picture Jesus being in her arms, but it says he was in a cradle. So she pointed, and Jesus, you know, like one day old, says, don't talk like that about my mother. <laughs> she is a virtuous woman. She is a virgin. And um, I've been appointed by God to be a prophet. And that kind of... Um, <laughs> whereas when we, have, when we have the story of Jesus proclaiming in the synagogue that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and they basically are saying, who, who is this guy? Where does he get all this stuff? Right? And they get ready to take him onto the brow of the hill and throw him off the brow of the hill. Uh, I think that's how it really happened. <laughs> but the Quran says, no, God wouldn't let that kind of thing happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. From our study in that uh, thing and then yeah. some interactions with Muslims about things in the Quran, it seems like there's a real emphasis on reward and punishment in Islam. Is that a true statement? or It's all about your behavior. If you have weird beliefs, God's going to let you in that. But if you behave as a good person who does the will of God, you're going to be fine. And if not, Hell is going to be really bad. So yeah, definitely. And there also is not nearly the emphasis as we Christians have uh, on forgiveness. They talk more about God being merciful rather than forgiving. And maybe it's not that different. But I like forgiving a lot. I, I like the, the um, prodigal son story. And I... I think that's what God's really like. As opposed to, you're really, really bad, but you're one of mine, so I'm going to let you in. I'm not requiring that, that you come to your senses, or I don't know. 
Yeah, Father. Do you know how, uh, so Jesus says, uh, forgive 70 times 7. Do they have a, a similar teaching about forgiving each other, loving your enemies, you know, do good to those who um, are you? No, in fact, they have a teaching that God does not love God's enemies. God doesn't love Satan. God is so fed up with Satan. Now, it doesn't name specific human beings. It really talks just about Satan. But the idea that God would love God's enemies, hey, that's just... So, and then, like, so the Lord's Prayer, of course, as, you know, Christian, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. In the, right, to the so, same, but, right. But, but the, the Muslim maybe wouldn't have that emphasis about forgive others as you have been forgiven. They would say that forgiving others is extremely uh, is a good thing to do and an important thing to do but the idea that your that your soul is going to be measured by the extent to which I, I, I don't think I can give a clear enough answer to that I don't think I know enough that's a great question forgiveness would be a good thing to do show sure. very very good thing to do uh, but uh, the, their version of the Lord's Prayer, the thing that they say all the time, is all about following the straight path, following the good path. And but our Lord's Prayer has it's it's like, it's kind of like the golden rule, but it's even better. It's like the platinum rule. <laughs> forgive one another as I have as I forgive you on earth as it is in heaven. That's pretty powerful. I Still a Christian, obviously. <laughs> what else? Yeah, please. Yeah. Do all the sects of Muslims or Islam do they all read the same Quran? Or yes. It's all the same. Quran? Oh yes, very much so. Okay. Yeah. On that, on that they don't they don't disagree. Okay. <clears throat> Everything else they do. Right. Yeah. Right. I had one one. Uh, passage in there that I think is just violated by well, a lot of people, actually Christians too, but it, it was in the Sarah uh, Women, chapter 90, verse 92. It said, it is unlawful for a believer to kill another believer, accidents accepted. Even kills a believer by design shall burn in hell forever. And you see a lot of Arabs killing Arabs. Well, of course, you see Christians killing Christians. Well, and, uh, and what they're saying is there are killings and then there are murders. Okay. And a murder is an unjustified, unlawful killing. Whereas a killing sometimes could be self defense or it could be an accident, like you said, an accident. So they're saying murder is immoral and is a mortal, unforgivable, I shouldn't say mortal sin in a Catholic church, but that's not. There's an actual definition of that. Um, it is uh, it is probably an unforgivable sin. And yes. So yeah, the two different sects, and you explain how they differ in the beginning one. Yeah. You follow the succession rules. Yeah. Uh, one one basically have a group select. Yeah. Has that passed on? Or are there a story to be that? Is it the end of that? Yeah, the Shiites have hung on to that, and they um, they still revere as saints the first twelve successors. But after that, they said there aren't going to be any more. So there's not a uh, there's not a just to confuse things. Those first twelve were called imams. <laughs> which is awkward because we now mean by imam just the person who stands in front of them, right? um, those first 12 the last one was uh, being hunted down by uh, by enemies and was a young man and he disappeared and the tradition says that he was occultated he was taken directly up into heaven like Elijah and like Jesus and like Enoch uh, didn't die. And that guy will come back on Judgment Day with Jesus. 
and will be like Jesus' right hand man or something like that <laughs> on Judgment Day. But the Sunnis um, did not recognize that succession. And they would say that the first four leaders were not imams, but they were caliphs or caliphs. And you might remember the ISIS was trying to claim that, that they were creating a caliphate. A caliph or, or caliph is like a supreme, it's a little bit of a pope and a president combined. Um, but the emphasis is greater on the religious authority. And, um, there have been plenty of people over the years since the early days that have said they were caliphs or caliphs, but they've never succeeded in being worldwide. Like, well, Muhammad's world wasn't terribly big, but those first four, they governed a really big uh, area. But no, they don't have that anymore. Yeah? The last 12 months, what's going to come down and govern from what's basically the site of the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Oh, oh yes. Even though they consider the Prophet Muhammad. No, the, Jesus, no, the Prophet Muhammad, this is a great question. The, the successors were less than Muhammad, and Muhammad was less than Jesus. The Quran is greater than Jesus. But Jesus never sinned that Muhammad did. Jesus did not commit violence. Muhammad did. There are lots of ways in which Muhammad was just a human being. And Jesus was just this miraculous human being. Um, Muhammad didn't work miracles like Jesus did. And if you, if you meet Muslims, ask them, what do you know about Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? They talk about Jesus like we do. They have great, great reverence for Jesus. And that really surprised me, and it really surprised my wife. Okay. We're out of time, guys. Yeah. Can't believe you listened for two hours. Well, thank you so much for coming and your attention and the questions. And in my mind, I. I envision this night going like this, and it's probably even much better than I envisioned. So thank you so very much. I know I have a few guests, and I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. I'm Deacon Richard Moore. I'm the Deacon here. I've been here almost 12 years now, which is kind of hard to realize. But uh, so I just thought I'd, for those that are here as guests, well, you know, thank you for coming. And if you want to come back, we're, we're open on the weekends. We're working. So, but thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you, John.